All right, everybody, let's get this show started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Science Cafe Bug Fest edition. I am your host. My name is Chris Smith. I am curator for the SCCU Daily Planet Theater at the museum. And every Thursday night at seven o'clock, I am your host for the Science Cafe. Thanks for joining us for this program. I hope that you've all been taking advantage of all the incredible Bug Fest programming that we have going on all week long. We've been talking all things bugs and arthropods since Monday morning, and we're gonna keep talking about it through Saturday late afternoon. Head to bugfest.org to get more information, see what programs are coming up tomorrow and Saturday, register for your favorites, and I hope we'll see you at some of our Bugfest programming. We've been learning a lot about incredible animals, bugs, arthropods, insects, the incredible diversity that exists in life on Earth. So hope that you can join us for that. Bugfest is sponsored by Terminex and BASF. Thank you very much. Uh, for the Science Cafe tonight, I also want to thank some friends of the museum, the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, who helped us put this program together as well. Now, we've got a cool program, uh, because if you've spent any time in the Southeast, then you've got to be familiar with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. In fact, I spent many uh, long weekends and vacations of my childhood hanging out in and around the Great Smokies. I went to college in the foothills of the Smokies. I have a special place in my heart for the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. And so having tonight's program be about the insects of the Smokies, I'm very excited. I hope that you are too. Let me introduce our guest speaker, Becky Nichols is an entomologist with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Becky, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be a part of Bug Fest this year. We're so glad that you could join us. Now, in this internet land that we're all existing with virtual programming, uh, where are you at in real space? I am actually in my office in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, um, which is on the Tennessee side, uh, just out of the town in Catlinburg. Oh, fantastic. I was, or before the show, I was trying to like peek out the windows behind you to see if I could get a glimpse of some, some smoky mountains, but uh, it looks like you've got some beautiful greenery there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's starting to get a little bit dark. Um, hopefully no animal will come by to interrupt the view, but uh, we do frequently see things in this area. We're way up here in the woods. So it's, it's a nice place to have your office for sure. Wait, should we be expecting like a black bear to just come peeking in? You to never your know. Office? You never know. <laughs> See, the Smokies are a magical place. Well, everybody, uh, we've got. It looks like we've got a great crowd tuned in. Let me remind everybody who's watching, uh, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, or Livestream.com, you can use the comment thread and the chat box to leave your questions, thoughts, comments, experiences as we go throughout the program. When we get to the end of the presentation, I'll actually moderate those questions out of the chat box and to Becky so that we can have a nice conversation about tonight's topic, bug fest and insects of the Smokies. So with that, uh, Becky, take it away. Okay. All right, well, I hope you can all see that. Uh, can I just do a check to make sure you can see it? I've got eyes on it. Okay, very good. Um, well, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to be discussing insect diversity in the Smokies. As you can imagine, it's a very diverse place, not only just insects, but a lot of other life as well. Um, so I've just I've picked out a few groups to talk about, um, including pollinators um, as a group, uh, fireflies, aquatic insects. And I'm also going to talk about uh, a project that we've been doing for the past 20 or so years to look more at the biodiversity in the park. Um, but I'll start off by just giving you um, a little background on the park. Um, it was established in 1934. It's about 500,000 acres by half a million. And it lies right in the border between North Carolina and Tennessee, as you can see right here. 
Uh, the elevations range from about 800 feet to over 6,000. We have a number of peaks in the park in the Southern Appalachians that are well over 6,000 feet. Um, it is considered an international biosphere reserve and a world heritage site. And those two designations are primarily because of the biodiversity and the cultural significance of, of the park as well. As far as rainfall, we get 80 to 100 inches per year at the higher elevations. A lot of that is in the form of snow. Um, although the past few years, have, we haven't had quite as much snow, uh, but we have had a lot of rainfall, especially this year. We just had uh, remnants of Hurricane Sally come through this morning and uh, we got a lot of rainfall out of that, but that was okay, we need that. And so we are um, considered a temperate rainforest because of the, the amount of rainfall we get, um, 50 to 60 inches per year at the lower elevations. Uh, the forest types, we've, we've got 130 different species of trees, um, but generally at the higher elevations, we get a spruce fir type of forest, um, uh, generally above 4,000, 4,500 feet. And that mixes with the spruce. As you go down slope, you get into the more northern hardwood forest type. And then at the Cove Hardwoods is where the, there's a lot of diversity in trees. As I mentioned, 130 different species with the largest amount of old growth um, in, in the East and way with up to 600 year old trees. Um, these forest types do, um, we do have to deal with a lot of uh, threats um, with regard to invasive species. Um, forest pests and diseases. We have a, a whole group of people that work specifically on pests of some of our forests. And I just picked out one uh, to kind of highlight and that's the hemlock woolly adelgi. Uh, adelgi sugi is the Latin name. Um, and so you can see in this background view, um, some of the dead hemlock on this slope. And uh, we, we have lost a number of hemlock, but uh, with our current treatment program, it where we've stabilized and things are, are doing fairly well. We've got a number of biocontrol species that have been released in the park and uh, are reproducing. And so you can go in the field and, and recover some of the adults. So that means that they are surviving and feeding on the adelgids, which is the job that they're supposed to be doing. So here you can see one of these, this is called Laracobius. Uh, that's the genus, and it is feeding on a, a hemlock adelgid there, uh, which is covered by this waxy coating here. And if you look on the underside of, of hemlock needles, you can see a one that's infested. You can see a lot of the, the cottony uh, tissue right in there. Um, and also, um, this is Sasagi skimness. That's another uh, biocontrol species that's been released. And it is a type of lady beetle. And so occasionally you'll hear people think that, that or they might think that the National Park Service has been releasing uh, ladybugs. Um, they actually are, but they're not the ones that you, you tend to find in your house. Those are a completely different species. So these are very, very tiny and they're a little black and you would not find them uh, in your home. Uh, we have about 2000 miles of streams in the park and those range in order from first through sixth. Now, if you're not familiar with the order system, that is basically referring to um, the number of tributaries that join together. And so a high elevation spring that just comes out of the ground is a first order stream. It doesn't have any other tributaries coming into it. Uh, when a, two first order streams join together, they become a second order and two second orders become a third order and so on. And so you can see that um, our streams don't get real large in the park, but basically uh, all of the, the, the streams that we have in the park originate within the park. And so our streams tend to be fairly pristine. Um, we do have some issues with acid deposition at the higher elevations, um, but generally speaking, uh, the water quality 
is fairly good. It is part of the Tennessee River watershed, which is known for the diversity of uh, aquatic species. So about 22 years ago in 1998, um, we felt like we needed more information about all the species that live here in the park. Um, we felt like we can better manage our resources if we know what's here and where they are, what their distributions are, what their ecological information, what species are associated with other species, et cetera. And so we started this project called the All Taxa Biodiversity Inventory. And taxa basically just refers to types. Um, a, a species is a taxa. Um, it can be used at a number of different levels, but basically we're trying to find all different species that live in the park. Um, and in order to conduct that project, we uh, created a, a nonprofit organization called Discover Life in America, and they coordinate the science, education, they do a lot of outreach and activities in partnership with, with us, with the Smokies. Um, so as a result of getting this project started, a number of researchers um, have come to the park to sample all sorts of different things. Um, I've picked out just a few um, to highlight. Uh, here, these people are looking for water mites. Um, this person is uh, netting for butterflies. This person is looking for algae. Uh, Bee cheating for beetles and black lighting for moths and using an aspirator here to collect insects down in the grass. And so it was really very interesting um, at the beginning of this project when a lot of different researchers came here to, to understand their techniques and how they, they sample for their specific taxonomic group. And so over the years we've had, uh, we get nearly 200 people, or excuse me, 200 research permits per year of people wanting to conduct uh, work on their particular group. Now in the Smokies, and this kind of pattern um, probably holds for a lot of natural areas where if you look at the proportion of different taxonomic groups, all of these things listed over here on the right, um, and the proportion compared to each other, you can see that insects here, the one in blue, tends to be the most diverse. There's a lot of different species in this group as compared to some of the others. Um, plants, of course, here in the Smokies, plants are very abundant and very diverse. And then fungi is another really big piece of the pie. And so those are areas that, that we've focused on over the years, in addition to the other groups as well. But we have uh, we found a number of new records and new to science species amongst these many of these groups. Now, when I say uh, new park record, that means that these are known species, but the distribution um, was not known to be within the park. And so a number of things have been found over the years, including um, tardigrades, water bears, uh, slime molds here. This is a small little millipede, a plant called leatherwood. Um, and that, this was surprising because after a number of years of botanical work in the park, to find a new woody species was, was somewhat of a surprise. But when you have this concentrated effort to, to find everything in the park, a lot of things turn up. And then this was the, the most surprising number, the number of species that have been found to date that are new to science, and meaning they have not been described prior to being discovered in the park. Although many of these occur outside of the park as well, but their range includes um, the park. Um, so I'm not saying that these are endemic only to the park, um, but some of them are. This one, for example, is, this is a, a new species of caddis fly called Neophylax kolodskii. Um, this is a, a type of moth called Ligdia. This is a, a columbola or springtail and a, a picture wing fly. So since the beginning, so before the project got started um, in 1998, we knew about 9,600 species of all life, including all different groups of 
about a third of those were insects. Um, since that time, we've nearly, we've actually more than doubled um, the number of new records is 9,700, and the number of new designs is over 1,000. The grand total now that we know of in the park is about 20,000. Now, some early estimates um, of what occurs in the park was initial estimates were about 100,000 species, and we've since backed off on that number a bit. I think it was a little bit overestimated. Uh, we now say 60 to 70,000 typically. Is, is what might be here. A lot of those are gonna be amongst groups like the fungi, um, which there's, there's a lot more to be found in, in that group. All right, I'm gonna focus on aquatic insects for a moment. Um, freshwater communities is a, is a grouping that uh, we have an active monitoring program for, and it includes aquatic macroinvertebrates, which are basically aquatic insects, and fish. And so we have a group of fisheries uh, staff that go out and monitor the diversity and abundance um, of these two different groups. Uh, this is us during the summer. We go out every summer and we go to specific watersheds and compare that data from year to year and basically look at uh, any changes in diversity or abundance that could be a red flag for any water quality issues. And to do that, we use what's called an EPT index. Um, and I'll go through each of the different groups uh, that comprise the, the EPT index. But basically what it stands for, the acronym EPT stands for Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Tricoptera. That, those are the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And so if we go to a sample site and we collect a bunch of things, we then pick out the EPTs, identify them to the species level, and run a calculation of what the abundance is for each one of those um, groups. And then we compare it to the previous years and known regional uh, numbers to see whether we're in range of, of good water quality or fair or medium or low water quality. So mayflies are really an abundant group here, 138 species in the park. You can recognize mayflies as compared to stoneflies, which I'll show you next. Um, but mayflies, if you look along here, this is the abdomen of the insect. And it always has gills along the abdomen, um, as opposed to stoneflies, which do not have gills there, as shown right here. So this, the gills on stoneflies are typically in, underneath by the legs or up here by the neck, or sometimes not visible at all. But if you don't see any gills along here, then you're probably uh, looking at a stonefly. This is called the giant stonefly, and this is the adult stage here. So the winged adult is fairly short-lived in both of these groups, the ephemeroptera and plecoptera, and also the, the caddisflies, which I'll talk about next. But the, the giant stonefly um, spends about a year in the aquatic system and then emerges as the adult. 136 species <clears throat> in the Smokies. And then the T, the part of the EPT index, are the Trichoptera caddisflies. Is, as you can see, 200, 241 species in the park. So it's a really diverse group. And they have all sorts of different lifestyles, making cases, in many cases, <laughs> or being free living where they don't build a case and that they'll use different materials, leaf particles, uh, rocks, et cetera. And then this is the adult stage. And some of the other groups that we find as we're sampling, but we don't use as part of the, the EPT index are the Odonata, uh, dragonflies and damselflies. They tend to be along the marginal areas of streams or in slow moving water. Um, much of the aquatic systems in the park is, are um, high gradient, fast flowing streams. So we, we don't find a lot of these during our sampling. We tend to see them more in the low lying uh, pond habitats. Diptera or flies, um, a lot of different forms as you can see here. Um, 
a really diverse group. I didn't put a number for this group because a lot of them are semi-aquatic and it's, uh, it's difficult to count them as being truly aquatic. So the numbers there vary a lot depending on what their lifestyle is. Uh, coleoptera are the beetles. Uh, many of the types of beetles that we find are water pennies. This is the larval stage of the water penny. Uh, usually a pretty good indicator of, of good water quality. And then the hemiptera, which are true bugs, includes things like the giant water bug, the water striders, and water boatmen. Again, we don't get a, a large amount of these in the stream sampling because they, the habitat is not quite to their liking in the fast flowing streams. And then the megaloptera, the dobson flies and fish flies. Now, many of you may have seen the adult stage like this where it's kind of scary looking uh, mandibles here, but uh, they really, this is the male and the female has much shorter mandibles. And this is the one you want to watch out for. She can pinch, but he can't really do much. This one is uh, sometimes referred to as the toe biter and the aquatic stage. And this one, you really don't want to pick that one up either. So since the beginning of the inventory and monitoring program, the freshwater communities monitoring program, the number of aquatic insect species is now at 955. So that, that is a really, really high number and uh, it does increase over time. We found a, a number of new records just recently. So uh, we'll keep that program going to, to keep tabs on water quality. So the other group I wanna talk about tonight are fireflies. So fireflies have been getting a lot of press over the last few years, um, primarily because of, of they are declining in a lot of cases. And the, the question I get a lot is, are they declining in the Smokies? And what is the reason for the decline nationwide? And I would have to say that in, in the park, I don't see a decline. It's, not, it's hard to quantify that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, from the synchronous firefly standpoint, which I spent a lot of time working on, um, I have not seen a change in the, in the display um, numbers. Uh, but nationwide, it's a bigger, it, there probably is um, some impacts going on. Um, but I, we can talk about that after this. But let me just go through some of the different groups that we have. Um, 19 different species are known to occur in the park. Uh, six of those do not flash. So a lot of fireflies don't even have light organs. Uh, 13 that are nocturnal and do flash. And there are several more that we expect to find, but they um, have not been located yet. But we, the range should include the park, but we haven't found them yet. So fireflies are actually beetles. They're in the family Lampyridae and there's 170 species in North America. Most of them, uh, these are based, these points are based on observations. Um, we know there's, there's more out here, uh, but generally most of the observations come from the East and the South. Um, 2,200 species worldwide, mostly tropical and temperate areas of the world. Just briefly, the firefly biology, which I think is important to understand <clears throat> if we're talking about conservation and, and potential declines of this group. Um, the adult stage lays an egg, um, her eggs, uh, on or just below the soil surface. And when they hatch the larval stage over winters, they spend most of their life cycle as the larval stage. And they are predaceous. They stay in the forest leaf litter and then in late spring, early summer, they pupate and emerge as adults. And uh, they don't live that long as adults, one to two and a half weeks. And sometimes they don't even feed. Like in the case of the synchronous firefly, they uh, do not feed. Um, they basically have one goal and that is to uh, find a mate through their flashing pattern and then they die. Um, others are predaceous and others feed on plant pollen and nectar. 
This is the typical looking firefly larval stage. Well, the adult stage has these uh, a light organ in the lower part of its abdomen. And uh, it's basically for mating recognition, as I mentioned. The larval stages glow as well. They're sometimes referred to as glow worms. And generally it's considered to be a warning to predators. Um, but the adult is primarily for, for mating. Uh, the chemicals involved are luciferin and luciferase, which is an enzyme that breaks down the luciferin with a production of light. Um, there actually are some differences in the light color. It's very subtle, you have to look pretty close, but you can see yellows, you can see greens, and in some cases, even blue or pale red. So I picked just a few of the common ones that I'll go through, um, just so you can get an idea of what they look like and what their flash pattern is. Um, and maybe you see these in your own backyard. Um, Photinus pyralis is called the evening firefly, or sometimes called the J firefly. And you can see on the underside here, this is the light organ. This is where the luciferin and the luciferase occur. And when they mix together, this whole part of the abdomen lights up. And this, is, this just indicates the flashing pattern. So this is the insect flying along and then it flashes as it swoops up and then it kind of drops back down and it does it again and again. And you'll frequently see this species um, over lawns or grassy fields, uh, often in very large numbers. Um, Photurus is re uh, referred to as the predator firefly. We have two species in the park. Um, they're pretty difficult to tell apart, so we're not exactly sure which two species we have, but they're known to fly really rapidly and very high usually with a very bright flash pattern. They're sometimes referred to as the flash bulb fireflies. And their flash period, uh, many fireflies have a distinct period of time that they do their flashing. And so theirs is 9.30 to 11.30. And um, females are also known to, they're called the femme fatales of the insect world. They, they use the wrong mating signal to attract a male of a different species so that they can eat them and get uh, a source of protein for egg production primarily. So they will capture other fireflies in flight as well. The blue ghost is, is a very popular firefly here. You know, many people come here to see the synchronous firefly and they end up uh, more enthralled with the blue ghost. Uh, this is a very small firefly with a little light organ here. Um, and their flash pattern is not really a flash, it's more like a glow. And it, it's on the bluish side, so they tend to fly fairly low and they just leave their flash organ on as they're flying around. So it creates this little ghosty uh, blur of light that's somewhat blue. Um, and sometimes they're a little hard to focus on and see because they're so small, but once you find them, um, they're really interesting to watch. And this is referred to as a larviform female. So this is actually an adult reproductive female, but she looks more like a larva than she does an adult. And then the star of the show is the Photinus carolinus, the synchronous firefly. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of people come to the park to see this species in the Elkmont area. We happen to have a pretty large population of of the synchronous firefly in that area. And it got to the point where so many people were going to this area that it became a management concern. We were worried about the resources itself, you know, too much trampling of the habitat and uh, safety concerns for the visitors there. And so we started to manage the situation by closing it down and uh, working with the town of Gatlinburg to uh, utilize their shuttles to take people about five miles up the road here to Elkmont and let them stay long enough to see the show. And then they get back on the shuttles and come back to the parking lot here at the visitor center. And this is an image of um, a lot of different fireflies flashing <clears throat> at one time. This is 
probably not exactly what you would see if you're to go out there. It is spectacular, don't get me wrong, but uh, this image actually has a lot of overlaid, um, uh, it's a stacked photograph so that a lot of different um, images of the same firefly are on here. So you can see one individual flashing in numerous places here. But still, it gives you an idea of the type of um, flashing display that you, you see out there with the synchronous firefly. And it really is spectacular. And it's a great photo. Um, you can purchase uh, field guides that have the different flash patterns if you're ever interested in, in learning them to recognize them by the flash patterns. Um, this is just a small example of some of the different species we have here. This is the, um, the synchronous firefly that flashes six to eight times, and then it has a period of darkness here. And that period of darkness is really what tells you that you're looking at the synchronous firefly. It's an unmistakable pattern that no other firefly in our area anyway follows. And you get others that do a double flash and then a few seconds off and another double flash. Um, here's the flash bulb firefly, just a large bright white flash. This is the J or the evening firefly that swoops up. And then the blue ghost up here at the top. And so by learning the different times of night that each of these species flashes, what their pattern is, and what uh, elevation in the forest uh, canopy that they're flying, you can learn to identify what species you're seeing fairly, fairly quickly. All right, switching gears a little bit here, we'll get into insect pollinators um, and some of the different groups that we find here in the park that are common you know, throughout the country. Um, we do have a, a pretty good number of these and I'll go through the different numbers, but we've been, had a lot of work done on uh, solitary bees recently. And so our numbers are, are pretty high for that group. But the four major groups for pollinating insects are bees and wasps, that's the, the order Hymenoptera, flies, that's the order Diptera, butterflies and moths, or the Lepidoptera, and beetles, the so Coleoptera. And of these four groups, um, I mean, some of the other groups may do a small amount of pollinating, but these are probably the most, most important as far as the amount of pollination services they provide. Uh, bees are the most important of all of those, be, probably mostly because they have um, branch hairs on their body. And so as you can see by this photo, they, they will get pollen all over themselves because it sticks to the hairs on their body. And they also have structures on their legs where they collect the pollen. And so um, most of the pollination is done by, by this group. 90% uh, of native bees are solitary. So they don't live in, in communal hives like the, the uh, honeybee. And on a single foraging trip, a female bee may visit hundreds of flowers. And so you can see um, how important uh, bees can be. And why do we care? Well, 75% of flowering plants on earth require pollinators. And also a lot of food for humans are in that group. And so we should be concerned about our own food supply uh, with regard to pollination services. And a recent study found that 80% of crops in Europe are pollinated by wild bees. So not necessarily just honeybees are, are pollinating crops. And the uh, US and Canada grow over 100 crops that need pollinators. And so they're a very important group. 276 species of bees in the park. Um, this has increased, as I mentioned, uh, quite a bit recently with some focused efforts that some of our researchers have been going to specific flowers where um, there's a mutual, uh, mutualistic um, interaction between the bee and the flower. And so if you go to the right host plant, you'll probably find uh, its pollinator and that's exactly what they've been doing. Just a few examples here of the types of the solitary bees, uh, leaf cutters, mason bees, and digger bees. And you can see there that um, the leaf cutters, you know, they, 
cut out a little chunk of leaf there to line their, their brood cells. Mason bees tend to live in, in old tunnels that are created by beetles or, or go into old dead wood. Digger bees dig these little holes in the ground, um, usually in a communal area. And they often move around. We have a number of areas where we've seen vast uh, colonies of digger bees. Um, and then the next year they'll, they've moved on, they go somewhere else. So beetles are another group. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, here's just some examples of the different types of, of beetles that you might see. Um, a lot of hair on this one, that's a scarab beetle. And so they're, they are, do have the potential to transfer pollen from plant to plant with those pollen getting stuck on the hairs. Moths and butterflies, so hummingbird moths. We got a, so this is called a tanukid moth and a variegated fritillary there on some lantana. And of course the monarch butterfly. So that one, is, is a species that we pay special attention to because of its uh, migratory nature and the, the need to preserve a lot of habitat along the way to their, um, the, the migrating um, areas in Mexico. Um, they do come through the park. We have monitored them and we do uh, participate in tagging. So we would collect uh, a monarch and put a little tag right here on the hind wing with a number that's coded. And then uh, as researchers are collecting data in Mexico, they can determine where that, if they find a tag, they can determine where that uh, particular individual came from. And so through work like that, we know that this, the group of monarchs that fly through the Smokies do end up in Mexico. Um, so monarchs have declined. Um, due to a lot of different factors, but loss of habitat is probably the main factor, not only in Mexico, but uh, in the US as well. And so there's a lot of efforts uh, to get um, backyards, uh, you know, monarch friendly and have people plant milkweed. Uh, the, the caterpillar here requires milkweed. And with enough people planting milkweed, perhaps, you know, we can we'll see an increase in their numbers. Another group that does pollinating it are the flies or diptera. You can see a number of uh, different groups here. The flower flies are the primary ones that you see typically around flowers. So some of the threats to pollinators, as I mentioned before, the loss of habitat is prob probably the, the prime one a degradation and fragmentation as well. Um, Invasive species, perhaps in some cases, uh, pollution, uh, herbicide resistant uh, GMO crops, which reduces the amount of uh, potential habitat uh, is the main reason for that. Um, so we've seen declines in uh, a couple examples here of, of ones that have, have really declined a lot are the rusty patch bumblebee, the one here on the right, and the yellow banded bumblebee is about to be it's been petitioned to be listed as a federally endangered species. This one already is listed as federally endangered. And so we haven't seen that species in the park since uh, 2001. And prior to that, it was actually fairly abundant. So it's declined rapidly uh, range-wide throughout the Eastern US. And so it's something that we always keep an eye out for and make sure that we have good habitat and we do monitor to see if, if it ever shows up again. So what can we do? Um, a lot of pollinators require uh, numerous types of habitats. So they need nesting habitats, and egg laying sites, they need floral resources throughout the season. Bumblebees, for example, have a very long uh, season. They, they start fairly early in the spring and and go until late fall. And so having flowers, blooming flowers um, for the length of that season is, is really what they need. They need undisturbed places to hibernate and of course areas that are pesticide free. Um, so you can provide nesting habitat for some kinds of bees in your backyard and um, 
make sure that you leave some areas undisturbed and enough flowers of floral resources and perhaps we can we can all together kind of increase the number of pollinators um, here in the US. So I think that's probably all I have. I'll just leave you with a nice view of the Smokies. Becky, thank you very much. You're welcome. Such a great, such a thorough review it feel, felt like of the diversity that you could see in the Smokies but also see pretty, pretty easily. Like that's not necessarily, uh, you wouldn't have to go ranging through the mountains for days, weeks, and months really to see some pretty impressive diversity. Just be there at the right time of year and check out some wildflowers on the trails. That's right, just go on a hike and, and you'll see a lot. So I'll remind everybody, uh, I'll give everybody a few minutes to digest the information and let me know what you think in the chat boxes, what questions you have. We'll grab those and go from there. Uh, Becky, you and I talked before the show a little bit and uh, synchronous fireflies, probably one of my favorite creatures out there. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in the Smokies years ago. I was a little bit younger than I am now, but uh, had the chance to see the synchronous fireflies and that is such an incredible sight. I can imagine why you would need to impose some management on that situation too, because it was very crowded, uh, but just an incredible feat of nature. Did you go on a shuttle or was it prior to us starting the manage, managed area? I seem to remember getting on a shuttle. Okay. But um, I know there's a lottery system now so the seats on the shuttle are limited. That's and right. when we went, they weren't. At least I don't recall having to uh, sign up for a lottery. We just sort of showed up. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So we've only been doing the lottery system for the past two or three years. And um, I think uh, generally that's gone over well. People were... Um, a little upset if they tried to get in to get a ticket. So you'd have to log into a computer to get a ticket to get on the shuttle. And if, you know, within just a couple minutes, it's like a, a rock concert or something, the tickets sold out very quickly and people didn't feel like they got an adequate chance to get a ticket. And so the lottery system kind of equals that out a little bit and they feel like they have a pretty good chance, as much chance as anybody else as getting, for getting a ticket. And so we, we have happier customers by doing it that way. But we definitely we do have to limit the number of people that go up there. Um, it's a, a sensitive resource in the fact that, you know, if people don't stay on the trail, they start wandering off into the woods, they'll be stepping on the females. So the female does, does not fly as much as the male, but she can fly, but she tends to stay lower to the ground. And so there's a potential for trampling if, if people are wandering around too much out there. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, so totally understand the need for, I mean, that's why the park is there, right? It's to right. protect the biodiversity of the region yeah. Yeah. and give uh, the public the chance to access it. Right. Got to, got to do both of those things. It's, it's a challenge so sometimes, exciting. but yes. So I'm curious then, and I'm, I'm going to stick with the synchronous because I love them, uh, but as an entomologist for the park, what do you find yourself doing during that short period in the summer when those fireflies are active? You know, people are going up in droves to see them. Are you like headed down the backside of the trails to sample or to observe or to try to count fireflies? What's your job? Uh, a little of both. It depends on the year. This year in particular, we we were shut down actually. It was right, right. as as the COVID-19 thing was, was uh, first starting. And so we decided not to, to have the event this year just for social distancing and safety of our visitors. Um, but in a normal, quote, normal year, um, I would generally go out there and just kind of monitor uh, the display from night to night. And so that we can determine when the peak night is and what the numbers look like 
as compared to previous years and just basically keep tabs on, on what's going on out there. And we also had a number of uh, research groups here this year that were trying to, um, they had a 360 degree camera where they were trying to take an, uh, a video of the flashing pattern and determine they're really getting into the synchrony of the flashing pattern. And so it was, it was really fascinating to see the type of research that goes on. So there's a question about them in the chat. So since we're on them, I'll okay. stick with it. Are the synchronous fireflies the only ones that have a synchronous pattern as in multiple fireflies flash at the same time? No, they're the only ones that we have in the park, but there, there are plenty of other species that do it. Um, there's one, you know, if I mentioned that there were a few species of fireflies that we think are here, but we haven't found them yet. One of those is another synchronous species that occurs throughout the South and Southeast um, and it's called Poturus frontalis. Um, it does have a synchronous flash pattern. It's not the same as uh, Photinus carolinus. Um, and I personally have not seen the, the flash pattern, but um, apparently it is uh, fairly spectacular too if you're in the right place with a large population. Um, and then in, in other areas of the world, you see synchronous fireflies. Southeast Asia is known as an area where there's, there's at least a, a couple different species that uh, are synchronous as well. So it's not unique to the Smokies, but it still is a pretty special uh, event that we have here, um, a, a population. And so it, the species also, it does not just occur in the park, it ranges throughout the Southern Appalachians. And so uh, there are other areas where, where you can see synchronous fireflies too. Excellent, excellent. All right, Lisa wants to know, uh, as an entomologist for the Great Smokies for a while, what is your favorite bug story? <laughs> My favorite bug story. Uh, well, you know, there, there's one um, type of mayfly that I, I always enjoy finding, and it's pretty hard to find. It's uh, called a baiticity, and it's called the shieldback mayfly. And it's a, a really unique type of um, mayfly. It's got like a little little shield over its back. It's got little points that come out to the side. And it, it's just kind of an adorable little mayfly. And so anytime I find it, which is only in uh, a couple different areas of the park, the habitat isn't quite right to find too many of them, but they're on the far west end of the park is where I can find them. Um, so that's always good to make sure that they're still here and uh, and thriving when I when I sample those and find them. This is another good one. Are there any citizen science projects that people can participate in? Uh, this user is asking about fireflies, but if there are others with other types of insects, it'd be good to mention them too. Yeah, we we do a lot of science, citizen science projects. They're primarily done through our cooperating. Uh, partner Discover Life in America. So they organize a lot of different um, activities that can you can be involved with. I would highly suggest that you check them out. DLIA.org is their website. And they will do things like, and this is all part of the All Tax of Biodiversity Inventory that we work on. Um, they will do things like uh, bio blitzes where they get a number of people involved to go out and sample a particular area or use uh, iNaturalist, the, the website to identify things and um, collect different things that come back to the, to the collections here. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that they involve citizen scientists in, in doing the, the ATBI, the inventory work. Excellent, excellent. Um, Corey wants to know, where do the bee pollinators hibernate? Well, a lot of them will hibernate um, under like thatches of, you know, vegetation, like at the base of a grass clump, for example, in the case of bumblebees, that's typically where they would hibernate. And, and so when you see a habitat that has a lot of debris 
and leaf litter and uh, dead grasses, for example, that's probably pretty good habitat for bees in that area. So it, it's always good to suggest that you, you might want to leave some of that un, you know, undisturbed for the winter because there could be bees hiding under there. Now, you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation insect declines. And certainly I've seen news reports and research studies uh, globally about insect declines. Um, and I, I hope they're not hitting the Smokies too hard. But I did notice, and I think maybe one of our viewers did too, that uh, pesticides specifically wasn't in that list that you gave us, short list albeit, but a uh, list of things that were impacting maybe the insects in the park. So would, would neighboring pesticides around the parks be a problem? Um, potentially, and that is something that we, we do look at once in a while um, with uh, some of the agricultural areas in the, in the region. Um, there is a potential for that to happen, but generally speaking, um, I don't think pesticides are a big problem, um, at least in this protected area. But when right. we're referring to the insect decline, um, generally it's referring to more of a, a, a regional or even a global issue um, where you have um, just overall abundance and diversity has, has declined. And there's been numerous uh, current research that has shown um, exactly that is happening in some areas. Um, what the reason is, is, is not completely clear at this point, um, but pesticides is probably one of the, the culprits is, and, and habitat loss is, is in my mind, is, is a really big part of this. So if, if you're um, developing an area and there's no uh, vegetation left or it's just manicured uh, areas, then you've, there's been a drastic decline in the habitat available for for overwintering, for, for just surviving. And so that's why we're seeing, probably that's why we're seeing such um, drops in numbers. Yeah, yeah, wow, interesting. Okay, let me see here. Uh, I've got more good questions for you. Okay, Renee, oh, Re Renee, I identify with this question so much having a grassy yard in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Renee's asking about fire ants. Do you <laughs> see fire ants in the park? Uh, yes. And what do you do to control them? Uh, generally, we don't. We only treat them if they're in an area that's gonna bother visitors. So mm -hmm. as you know, probably the fire ants tend to prefer uh, disturbed areas. So they're, they're in mowed areas or along the curbs by parking lots, open sunny areas generally is where you find them. So if they're you know, next to a campground where people are gonna constantly step on the mound, then we'll probably treat them. Um, we're not too concerned about them getting into the interior of the forest because they do tend to like the disturbed open sunnier areas. And so deep in the forest is probably not uh, where they're going to spread. So we're, uh, we do keep an eye on them and then treat them only on occasion when we feel it's necessary. Thank you. All right, Missy on Facebook wants to know, do you see assassin bugs in the area? Yes, yes. Yeah, and in fact, we had a, a recent um, research project looking for for more species of assassin bugs. So we felt like that was a group that um, as part of the ATBI, that was a group that we didn't have enough. Uh, we, we felt like there were more species to be found in that group. And so we actively pursued that and worked with a researcher in California to do identifications. Um, and so we've increased the number of species that we find. Um, and there's probably more to be found. With all of these groups, especially among the insects, there's always more to be found. And we'll probably never be done with the ATBI, but you know, we'll reach a point where um, we feel like we've gotten 95% of the species, um, but you know, it will be an ongoing project. 
for many, many years. <laughs> that's, I guess in a way that's good to hear. Like yeah. there's just, and there's so much diversity. There's so much cryptic diversity. Right. Right. Things that look similar, but the diversity is just sort of hiding in the genetics maybe. Yeah. Yeah. There's sure. so much interesting work to be done. Okay. A few more, maybe I'm looking at the clock too. And Hey, let me remind everybody you're tuned in watching us. I have a special surprise when, when we wrap up the Q and I'm going to do that in just a moment, but don't log off. Stay with me because there's something super exciting that we're going to do right here at the very end. Okay. So stick with me. Okay. Taylor wants to know what's your personal favorite insect that you've seen in the park. You mentioned this rare mayfly. Yeah, yeah. I'll stick with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you back up in the video just a couple of minutes and you find out about this the mayfly. Okay. Uh, how did you become interested in being an entomologist? Oh, great question. Um, so when I started college, I was um, I was interested in biology in general. I wasn't sure what I wanted to focus on, so I I ended up being a wildlife biology major. And as a prerequisite or uh, required classes for that degree, I ended up taking an entomology class. So it was an elective. I could have chosen some other ones, but for some reason I chose entomology. And um, that was kind of a turning point right there. I had a really good instructor and who actually turned out to be my major advisor in graduate school uh, for both master's and PhD. So yeah, that was a, 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 a real change when I took that class and I had to make an insect collection and started looking at insects under a microscope and it was just like a whole new world um, that I became interested in. And so that was the turning point right there. And so after I finished my degree in wildlife biology, then I, I was into entomology from there on out. How did you wind up in the Smokies? Well, I was just looking for a job. <laughs> I had finished my doctorate in Missouri. I was at University of Missouri and I really enjoyed school and I stayed in school for quite a while. I even did a postdoc for a while. I sort of didn't want to leave the campus environment, you know. Um, sure. But then I was looking for work and uh, this job popped open in the Smokies. And to be honest, I wasn't sure where the Smokies even were. So I had to look on a map. It's like, where is Great Smoky Mountains? And uh, so luckily I was able to, I, the, the job requirements were very similar to some of the work I had done as a graduate student. And so luckily I, I got the job and I've been here ever since. Incredible. The Smokies are better for it. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent stuff, excellent stuff. Well. Becky, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Everybody, thanks for your questions. Now it's time for the surprise. Now, if you've been to the Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh and you've come to our Thursday night program, the Science Cafe, normally we do it live in person. Our guests are in the space. We have dinner inside the Daily Planet Cafe. And then every so often when we've got some really interesting topics, some really inspiring topics, uh, we have special guests with us. I would like Dan, Anna, Jonathan, go ahead and join me here in the show. Welcome everybody, the Living Poets, our guests from Living Poetry. Now, if you've not been a part of our show before, here's what's going to happen. These three special guests have been writing poetry about tonight's topic as Becky was speaking. So they started with blank sheets of paper and now they hope, we <laughs> I hope we have poems. So uh, Anna, do you wanna get us kicked off? You can introduce yourself in the group and, and then I cannot wait to hear what you've got for us. I will bring you into the program, that's right. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. 
My name is Anna Weaver, um, and I am a member of a group called Living Poetry. Uh, and I'll just uh, tell you a little bit about what that is before I read my poem. We are the largest poetry group in the Triangle. We were founded 11 years ago, and we run monthly workshops, weekly poetry prompts, and occasional open mics. And you can find and join us on Meetup. Uh, just search on Living Poetry. We keep a calendar of events there. And you can also find more information about us at livingpoetry.net. So the poem I wrote tonight um, is called The Great Smoky Mountains Throw a Party. With luciferin and blue ghost lighting to synchronize the mood and everyone in their finest. Millipedes in their disco fringe, ticks stepping out in bright orange shellac, the stonefly rocking a black on black tuxedo look, red band like a natty bow tie, while the mayfly poses like a bride, gilded in her gills, wings just so. The ladybug comes hungry, looking like you've never seen her in that little black dress. She sighs a little as the water slider, that old show off, breaks out his trick of miraculous grace. And somehow the bees manage to get better looking as they drain every punch bowl. Like any good party, the word gets out. But it's easy to spot the crashers by their uninspired khakis, their headlamps and hip waders, bumping and rustling the celebrities, begging for photographs, hoping for a story of that time they met a thousand beautiful new faces. Excellent. Thank you, thank you. So that is my poem. Uh, next up is going to be um, another member of our group, Jonathan Sanyer. Hello, everybody. Okay, my poem is called Femme Fatale of the Insect World or Blue Ghost. Fun guy, a big piece of the pie. And I wonder if or when or why I will ever meet my butterfly. If she was previously known, then when would my house become our home? Metamorphosed from a cocoon, indexed and categorized, I swoon. In the daylight before her, I would lack luster like I lack light organs. But she sparked my entire species fire, so now we fly inspired. Now, I am only an insect, so don't expect intellect on psychology or biology, but cheers. Cheers to Bugfest. Please have some bug juice for me. Oh, I love that. And then our last poet of the night is Dan Bull. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here virtually this time. Uh, my poem is called Bugs, uh, Anthropods, Insects of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Or is it arthropods? Arthropods. Arthro. Arthropods. I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Bugs arthropods, insects of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We've got a special place for you in our hearts. On the Tennessee side, just outside a town called Gatlinburg, forest types face threats. See those bare trees? We needed more info in 1998. Scientists take to the leaves, collecting water mites, netting butterflies, doing pond stuff tubes of insects coming from a scientist's mouth. Not really sure what that was all about. <laughs> thousand, <laughs> 1,000 new species discovered. Neofly larynx, kolodskii. Could you say that? Will you say Neophylax that? Kolodskii. Is it an artwork or is it a fly? Tardigrades are astronauts we found on Earth, free living, much longer lived than the mayfly. Cases in many cases, leaf tents, slow moving water, water bugs that skate upon the stream. Water strider sounds like a character out of a fantasy, but fireflies get press because their magic disappearing. Sometimes they don't even feed. It's flash until you die. Luciferin and oxygen equals enzyme. Sometimes found in the evening firefly. Go to Elkmont. It's spectacular, don't get me wrong. 
but many get enthralled with the blue ghost glow, episodic, restless need for newness, meandering the sky like a tiny tributary. Really good. Love that. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful stuff. Y'all, it is always a pleasure to have living poetry at the Science Cafe. It, it just feels great. Like there's a satisfaction that comes from the, uh, the sort of the distillation of the topic, but just the perspective that, you know, somebody who's not reading about these things in scientific research journals like me, or, you know, or taking, taking them in in that way. I love it. I love it when it all comes together like this. So, uh, you know what? There's a lot more Bugfest headed you all's way. What do you want to do? You want to go to bugfest.org, sign up for more of our free virtual programming that's going to be happening tomorrow and Saturday. Stuff all day long, both days. Great topics. You don't want to miss it. We have amazing speakers, interactive programs just for you. Bugfest.org is where you want to be. Now, uh, you can also follow the museum on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're at Natural Sciences. And if you haven't heard the news, the museum's downtown location in Raleigh will be opening to the public on September 22nd. So you go to the museum's website, you can get all the information about our new operating hours, how you can get your free timed reservations to come and visit, and you can read up on our new protocols for visiting and what we're doing to make sure everyone stays safe inside our museum. We cannot wait to see you all back again as soon as next Tuesday, 10 a.m. So naturalsciences.org, go check it out. And while you're there, there's a lot of great resources. Do it yourself activities at home. Check out the Science at Home page. We're doing all kinds of great virtual programming and we're gonna keep doing a lot of these great programs even after we open. So. Go check that out. And I hope that we'll see you again real soon here at the Virtual Science Cafe as well. Next Thursday night at seven, we're gonna be talking with a crayfish biologist who's discovered some new species. So you don't wanna miss that one. We're gonna talk cryptic crayfishes next Thursday at seven o'clock right here at the museum's YouTube channel. Like and subscribe, click the bell to get notified. You do all that stuff. You'll get the notification you need to come and join us. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you again to Living Poetry. Thank you, Becky from the Great Smoky Mountains for being with us. And everybody take care and stay safe. Good night.